This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Tuberculosis has been part of the human story for a very long time. You might know it as consumption, a turn-of-the-century disease that conjures up images of pale, delicate women coughing into lace handkerchiefs. In the 1800s, tuberculosis was causing death and suffering on an incredible scale. In Europe and America, It caused one out of every seven deaths. And people didn't know what caused it. They thought consumption maybe ran in families. The only treatments were rest, fresh air, and sunshine. And then on March 24, 1882, a scientist named Robert Koch astounded the scientific community when he announced he had discovered the cause of tuberculosis. It was a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this announcement was a turning point in our battle against TB. Koch's discovery gave us an enemy we could fight. It earned him the Nobel Prize and led to advances in hygiene and eventually to the development of antibiotics that worked against the TB pathogen. Now every year on March 24th, organizations involved in the fight against TB observe World Tuberculosis Day to raise awareness about this deadly disease. On this episode of Origin Stories, we're marking World Tuberculosis Day with the first episode in a two-part series about how infectious disease has shaped human evolution. We'll take a look at our deep history with tuberculosis and hear a surprising story about the origins and evolution of one of the world's deadliest killers. And unfortunately, TB isn't only a disease of the past. According to the World Health Organization, it's the leading cause of death by infectious disease today. The WHO estimates that about 9 million people get TB each year. About 1.5 million people die from TB annually. This is Ann Stone. She's a molecular anthropologist at Arizona State University, where she runs the Stone Lab. My laboratory works on questions about the population history, the evolutionary history of humans and other primates, as well as our disease history. So we work on a range of projects from the population history of chimpanzees to um, how people adapt to their environments. And part of that is how they adapt to disease. I'm very much interested in in disease as a selective force because we know that it's probably been the strongest selective force for humans over our evolutionary history. I have focused on tuberculosis. Our long history with TB is one of the things that makes it so fascinating. TB was known to the ancient Greeks. Hippocrates wrote that it was the most common cause of illness and always fatal. It's written about in the ancient Indian Vedas and classic Chinese medical texts. Modern scientists had two main hunches about TB's origins. They thought either it originated very early on in human evolution, maybe as early as three million years ago, or they thought we picked it up from cows at the dawn of agriculture when we started to live more closely with cattle. So there's been this debate about how long we've had it and where we got it, but we know it's been causing human suffering and death on a large scale for a very long time. So, so tuberculosis has affected human populations for centuries, and we know from the London Bills of Mortality that uh, in the 1600s, it may have been the cause of death for about 20% of the deaths. So we, we know that it's had a long-term impact, and probably with the increased urban density um, and people living in close quarters, it became a, a greater problem. The way TB usually spreads is when people breathe in infected droplets, like from the cough of another person who's sick with TB. And that will either start to make you sick, or as is the case with the overwhelming majority of people, your immune system deals with it. There are many people walking around in the world who have latent TB and they don't know it. And then, later on, if that person becomes immunocompromised, TB can basically escape the cell that the immune system has built around it 
and cause active tuberculosis? Typically, it's a pulmonary disease. Uh, People lose weight, they cough, they become kind of emaciated, they may cough blood, they'll have fevers, they'll just be fatigued. Uh, And for centuries, it was known as consumption, right? The sort of disease that you slowly died from. Tuberculosis has been really interesting to anthropologists because not only has it been so widespread, it does something that few other diseases do. It shows up in the archaeological record. So there are many diseases that kill very quickly. And so when you find the skeleton of someone who died very quickly from one of these diseases, they look healthy, except they're dead, (laughs) right? And so, um, but tuberculosis, because it, it can be a very slow and chronic disease, can cause lesions that are identifiable. What do these lesions look like? The lesions basically look like kind of holes, uh, chewed up holes. So what's the earliest evidence of tuberculosis that's commonly agreed on? The oldest case that I think everyone would agree on, it dates from about 4000 BC from Italy. Some of the puzzles that people who study ancient diseases are trying to solve are things like how old is it? Where did it start? How is it spread? And since you can see evidence of TB in the bones, scientists can use the archaeological record, along with DNA, to track TB spread around the world and through time and across species. Because while TB typically spreads between humans, it can also spread from humans to other animals or from other animals back to humans. So when we look at the phylogeny of modern tuberculosis complex strains, these animal strains are nested within the human strains. And so one of the things I'm really interested in is how have the tuberculosis strains spread around the world? Stone is especially interested in how the way TB spread changed during the age of exploration. In particular, how has the age of exploration affected that patterning? sort of pre and post age of exploration. And when we look at the strains in animals, how did they, you know, when did they get it from us? On what occasions have they sort of given it back to us? Those sorts of things have have been of interest. They weren't actually, I was sort of dragged into that interest in a sense. Stone was dragged into it by a colleague named Jane Bikestra an archaeologist who's also really interested in tuberculosis. And a few years ago, Bikestra came to Stone with a very strange discovery. Archaeologists and bioarchaeologists, like my colleague Jane Bikestra, um, started really identifying clear cases of tuberculosis in the Americas pre-contact. She had found telltale signs of TB in thousand-year-old mummies in southern Peru from way before Europeans had ever been in the Americas. There are certain parts of the world where you may get mummies preserved. And this is usually really dry places like Egypt or parts of Peru, southern Peru is the northern extent of the Atacama Desert. So it's very, very dry. And the preservation is amazing. There'll be wooden bowls and, you know, these beautiful textiles in these burials that look as bright as when they were buried, I think. These 68 mummies were from a time and a place where there shouldn't have been TB. So Stone and her colleagues had a really big mystery to solve. How is it even possible for there to be TB in the Americas before Europeans and their cows got there? And so then the question became, all right, what kind of strains are these? Because today, when you look in the Americas, all the strains uh, are European origin. So basically, the, after European contact, there was a major replacement of tuberculosis strains. And remember, there was this very strong idea that humans first got TB from cows. This idea that, that cows gave us TB was very strong, and therefore it was assumed that there was no tuberculosis in the Americas pre-contact 
because there were no cows in the Americas pre-contact. But it was there, for sure. So where could it have come from? Using archaeology and information from ancient DNA, they started to try to solve the mystery. So Stone and her colleagues carefully collected DNA samples from the 68 mummies. And working with ancient DNA is very tricky and difficult, but they were able to get enough from three of the mummies to reconstruct the entire genome of the bacteria in each of those three individuals. We thought what we were going to find was that some of these older East Asian strains of tuberculosis had come over the Bering Strait with the first Americans, and that TB was old and it had gotten there when people walked to the Americas. Um, that was not what we found, <laughs> and, and we were actually very surprised. What they found was that the TB strains they pulled from the Peruvian mummies were different than other known human-adapted strains. These strains are most closely related to strains found today in pinnipeds. And pinnipeds are seals and sea lions. So what they think happened is this. TB emerged in humans in Africa, spread to other humans, but we also gave it to animals, including domesticated animals like cows and goats. Then seals came up onto the beaches in Africa to have their pups and picked up tuberculosis from either people or animals, they're not sure which. Then those seals passed it on to other Southern Hemisphere seals, and then they, those other seals, brought it to the Americas, where people like to eat seals. And so probably in the process of butchering seals or eating meat that wasn't completely cooked, uh, they acquired tuberculosis from the seals. So this was not what we expected. Another surprise came when they looked at how old this TB was. Knowing that the mummies were a thousand years old, they were able to establish a molecular clock, a way to date changes that happen in the DNA of the TB bacteria. Normally when you're asking questions about the evolutionary history of a species, so let's say we're talking about primates, um, we can look at the archaeological record. And we know when certain events happened, say the separation of old world monkeys and new world monkeys. And we can use that as a time point, uh, a sort of a calibration point in our clock to then date parts of that family tree that maybe we don't know as well. With bacteria, we don't really have that because we don't really have bacterial fossils. And with ancient DNA, they can take a sample from a bone that's clearly infected with TB, radiocarbon date it, and sequence the genome of the bacteria in that infected bone, or mummy. And use that as a way to calibrate the molecular clock. So how many changes have occurred, you know, given the amount of time from then till now. And with TB, before Stone and her colleagues' work, we only had a few points set on TB's molecular clock. We knew the Earth's atmosphere became oxygenated about two and a half billion years ago, and a lot of bacteria that needs oxygen originated then. And then 60 years ago, someone took a strain, a culture of TB, and put it in the freezer. So we have these really old calibration dates and this really young calibration date. And depending on which you use, or even if you use both, it would, depending on your method, it would really bias your estimate of how old TB was and make it really old or really young. And so the previous estimates of the origin of TB in humans ranged from 3 million to 20,000 years. So they added the information from the thousand-year-old mummy samples to calibrate the clock and find a more accurate date for when tuberculosis originated. And when we did that, we found that the most recent common ancestor for all of these strains was roughly 3,000 to 6,000 years ago, which was much more recent than we'd expected. We assumed that either TB was 
older than agriculture or possibly acquired during you know domestication but um, I think most most of us thought it was older uh, and so we were quite surprised when it was quite quite a bit younger from seals on the shores of Africa to ancient mummies in the Peruvian desert to the slums of 16th century London and around the world today TB has infected sickened and killed us by the millions but now, with new investigative techniques, we're developing a deeper understanding that will help us fight it in the future. So it's sort of, <laughs> you know, truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> the results of this study were published in the journal Nature in 2014, and they have given us an important new piece of the story about our long history with tuberculosis. Thanks to Ann Stone for sharing her work with us. We'll have links to more about her work in the show notes. Next time on Origin Stories, the evolutionary arms race between us and disease-causing microbes. We'll look at how the human story has been shaped by infectious disease and how understanding both human adaptation and disease adaptation can help us fight ancient pathogens like TB and emerging threats like Ebola. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation. The Leakey Foundation advances human origins research and offers educational opportunities to cultivate a deeper, collective understanding of what it means to be human. We provide venture capital for scientists through research grants and share their groundbreaking discoveries through our podcast, website, and lecture programs. We also give scholarships to students from developing countries to attend field schools and earn advanced degrees. You can learn more at leakyfoundation.org. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. You can also find and follow the Leaky Foundation on Facebook and Twitter. For a limited time, all donations to the Leaky Foundation will be matched. So double your impact on science by going to leakyfoundation.org slash donate and make a tax-deductible gift today. Transcripts are provided by Adapt Word Management, Intelligent Transcripts. Visit adaptwordmanagement.com for all of your transcription needs. And visit stoptb.org to learn more about the World TB Day Initiative. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. We have music by Henry Nagel, Lee Rosevere, Poddington Bear, and Black Ant. Thanks for listening.